that, that has been inflicted upon him. So the artist creates counter environments that illuminate what is going on in the environment that has fallen below the threshold of the cultural consciousness. So the artist's job is, is to excavate these, fall, these environmental awarenesses that have fallen below the threshold of perception to everyone else and make them visible to the rest of us so that we can see how strange and bizarre our situation really is. And whether it's an alarming one or not, whether if it's an alarming one, we'll get science fiction scenarios like in James Cameron's Terminator films where clearly the culture is having a nightmare about its machines and uh, it's trying to get our attention and tell us that there's something we need to do to fix this situation. Uh, so whether it's, a, it's something that needs to be fixed or whether it's something that just needs to be presented and will heal itself just in the act of coming to awareness of it uh, depends on the Okay, this is uh, one of the chapters you, uh, you talk about Google Earth, uh, which was... Um, to me, a uh, really wonderful thing when it, when it arrived. It was, it was like being a little magic genie, um, and uh, it seemed magical, then, but also sort of creepy in a way, that you, you, there's somebody up there and you could actually go in and you had somebody's address. You could, first of all, just look at the top of their house, but then later with Street View, uh, you could actually be a stalker. And voyeurism and stalking is something that you, that you mentioned in your, your previous book. Um, and uh, so it's it's tremendously uh, indis interesting in terms of um, you know the, the cartography of of the the the, uh, the human mind and, the, and the, giving us this sort of um, feeling of empowerment. You know, you talk I think about uh, you mentioned Deleuze and a thousand plateaus, and also you talk about the difference between uh, eminence and transcendence, and how um, Google Earth. Uh, Sort of uh, relates to this, those ideas, and I, I found that chapter to be to be very um, thought provoking. Yeah, uh, Deleuze. I took one line from *A Thousand Plateaus*, where Deleuze and Guattari say uh, transcendence, a specifically Western disease, and it seemed to me that, that that is exactly the case, and that you can trace this in every aspect of our society. We always like to be above something, looking down at it. That has been uh, because it gives us control over what we're looking at, and that's been the, the Western orientation forever. Whereas if you look in the Far East, the idea is imminence. Everything comes up out of the earth. And if you compare the cultural styles of East and West, it becomes very clear even in the furniture. We sit on desks, or we sit in front of desks on chairs. We're raised up. We sit on beds that are raised. We sleep on beds that are raised up on, from the ground, whereas the Japanese sleep on these tatami mats. Uh, they sit on the ground when they eat their meals. They're, they're very close to the earth because they, they're, they have an imminental uh, cosmology in which kami spirits exist everywhere. And Everything has its kami spirits. Uh, as, you know, so, so real quick for the for the viewer who might not know, um, how, what is the difference between say imminence and transcendence? Um, just just very basically, whether um, your point of view is embedded in the earth, or whether you see spirit as something that comes down from heaven and looks over the earth, exactly as in that image of Bosch's crystal globe right. with Yahweh right. floating up, uh, above it, looking down. That's Google Earth already, right there. It's already prefigured. And you, the user, are that, that Yahweh icon looking down over the earth with Google Earth. So it's a transcendentalist idea that you have the earth under your control and that you can shrink it down to the level of a plaything and have complete control over it. And it's perfectly consistent with the Western history of control over the earth. You know, from the first page of the book of Genesis, where we have the spirit moved over the waters, and then God brings creation into being by working on those waters, blowing down onto them, and creating this world out of clay and mud, like a pottery, a Neolithic pottery craftsman making his pottery that he's completely separate from, and to get it going, he simply blows on it, and the spirit breath animates it, and then you get Adam walking around. That's a transcendental mythology. These things have not grown up plant-like out of the earth. They were put on it by a deity who is exterior to the earth. Whereas in the Far East, uh, especially in India, uh, and in some of the Greek mythologies, like in Hesiod, you still have this preserved from an older archaic stratum of thought. Uh, the world creates itself by itself, it unfolds from out of itself, and every living thing springs up out of it, including human beings, as in the case of in Hesiod with the Theogony, where Gaia gives birth to Uranus, her husband, the sky god, and then mates with him to produce all the titans are, and so forth. Are, are, these the, uh, are these the thonic gods? Do I have that word correct? Um, there's a whole classification of, of gods that, that are associated with the earth, and perhaps Hecate is one of them. Um, There's no form of contrast to the Homeric pantheon. Right. Homer, 
Homer uh, is out on the islands. He lives out in the island where, where you're constantly being exposed to ships coming in from afar, so you've always got new ideas coming in. And Homer was open to some new ideas. And you have the Greek gods out there, and they're divorced from the agrarian way of life. Hesiod was a landlocked farmer preserving ancient agrarian traditions. And so he preserves these myths, whereas with Homer we get the myth of the sky god throwing the thunderbolts down and the gods coming down transcendentally to the earth, interfering at certain strategic points in the destiny of the West. That's a transcendental point of view. Uh, whereas in India, let's say in Hindu mythology, where the, where the universe emerges uh, as the great self that splits into a male and female, and they begin mating and they produce everything in creation, that, that's almost like looking at a, a, you know, a cell that, that splits mitotically and, and keeps splitting until an organism, a complete organism, is formed. Uh, and that may have come to some yogi as a proprioceptive vision while in trance state and then been blown up to the level of an entire cosmology. But with Google Earth, uh, you are the user who has come in from above. You can look wherever you want. And when you click Street View, you're dumped out down onto the street. Uh, like the soul in uh, Greek mythology that comes down through the transcendental spheres, and each sphere picks up a different archetypal quality until you wind up on the earth born in a body. And, and that's, a, that's an a idea from Pythagoras, right? If I'm correct about that? Yeah, it's starting. Okay. And it's, uh, it's feeling he's preserving it from older sources. But something yeah. uni universalis or something? Or I looked it up briefly because I wasn't familiar with it. I have a, a, a graph of it. And, and then something about as the soul descends, it, it passes through the uh, muses or the virtues or, or something like that. Each um, one of the spheres is associated with a different note of the diatonic scale. Right. So as the spheres turn, they make the music of the spheres. That was Pythagoras' main idea, the music of the spheres. And that because those uh, notes are imprinted upon the soul at birth, that music is within us. So education just consists in reawakening that knowledge. Uh, this is not. Uh, this is would be opposite to the tabula rasa view of the human being, uh, as you get with John Locke in, in philosophy in the West, where the soul is a blank slate and we don't know anything, so we have to be instructed. And so everything that we know is based upon our experiences in the world. Uh, so this denies that there's any kind of innate knowledge. Whereas Pythagoras and Plato were were coming into this, were bringing uh, and preserving this idea that the soul already contains all of this knowledge inside of it as the result of its journey through the cosmos before birth. And education just consists in reawakening that knowledge, recollecting it. This is what's called anamnesis in Plato, recollecting that knowledge and remembering it, bringing it to consciousness. So, so that's the, the transcendental yeah. worldview that I think we're still looking at with Google. We're, we're still in the, role of, in the role of the deity, looking over his creation, playing around with it, and I think it gives us an illusion, the illusion that we're in control of it. And we know we're not in control of it because we keep getting now these counter thrusts from Gaia, as it were, with all these floods and tsunamis and earthquakes that are going on that we cannot control and will never be able to control. But we've surrounded Gaia, and now we're beginning to warm the polar ice cap, the sea levels are rising, and we're going to see all this crazy phenomena that's going to start happening. And it's, we're already in the midst of it happening with record, you know, every year we get a record something, a record heat wave, uh, like the heat wave that struck France in 2003. Uh, this, something like 30,000 people were killed in that heat wave. And uh, the, you know, the hottest year on record, it was 2005. Every year there's some sort of new record weather anomaly. And this all comes out of the fact that the Earth is its own system. It's a self-regulating system that will do anything it can to keep itself alive, even including the elimination of human beings if that if that's necessary. Right. If that's what it turns out to well, be. It, it reminds me of that epic uh, battle called the Gigantomachy, uh, yes. which ha happened after the Titanomachy, um, in, in which all of this sort of got played out. I, I can't remember how the uh, uh, Olympian gods won. I think the, the Moira, Moira, where the fates were on the side of the uh, uh, the older gods, but there was somebody, maybe it was Hercules who intervened or something like that, but um, the Olympians prevailed. Um, but all of all of this is leading to sort of wrapping it up when you when you talk about uh, Paul Virilio and the Earth as a toy uh, that could easily be discarded, right? That we're not in the planet, but we're on it, uh, and therefore a connection to it um, is not one that's very deep. And maybe that's why we don't care about it too much. Um, and we still have fantasies of sending people to Mars and all this kind of stuff. And I really don't think there's a point to any of that. 
Um, and yet it's, it's a very, it's a very potent, um, mythos. Certainly it was one in, for America in the sixties that was enormously, uh, significant, uh, you know, the event every time the space shuttle goes up, um, it's a, and you remember where you were when they, when they, uh, I think it was in the fifth grade when the Columbia blew up or something like that. So, um, the, the whole conquest of space is, is kind of culminated in many ways, perhaps in Google Earth, but then, um, you know, how long can we, can we keep that up before we're crashed back down to the, the, the planet? And then, yeah, as you mentioned, maybe we, we'd be more apt to uh, create something called Google Underworld, <laughs> which I love. It's also really a, a technology of imminence where instead of uh, hovering above and dropping down to a street view, you would have tunneled through the earth and then popped up like a periscope of a submarine and looked around at the street and then gone down and tunneled somewhere else. That would have been the more Hesiodic approach. I think. <laughs> right, and maybe in, in a society that, that uh, had some ancestor worship as well. That would have yes, been exactly. Thing to do the Native Americans where they have the myth yeah. that uh, in the, south, the American Southwest that they came up out of the earth, that, that right. just like plants, they, they emerged. So, John, the you also have a chapter in the book on well. Facebook. Uh, which I think just about everybody, hopefully, at this point is um, familiar with. But you take a very interesting take on it because you talk about the concept of faciality, which is maybe something that we take uh, for granted. Um, and, and maybe part of the idea of the, the uh, chapter is that the way in which um, Facebook er, actually works is sort of counter to um, how we want it to work, which is to say... Uh, we we need these uh, virtual environments because they don't exist anymore. Uh, but through Facebook, um, we become flattened to the extent that can we really uh, have a virtual environment that replicates something to be uh, a cafe. So you talk about um, the early concepts of faciality. I, of course, thought about the uh, Roman mummy statues at Fayum. Do you know about those? Uh, which even predate um, Christus, the Christus Pantocrator, which is what you talk about as... Uh, our idea of what the face is, which is to say the you know the white male looking straight at you, um, and this reminds me too of the the Koros statues uh, before um, Greek sculpture uh, goes through the classical phase uh, that you get with uh, Polyclitos and the Dorypheros. So maybe talk a little bit about um, what that has to do with Facebook, what all of those things are, and uh, how you see Facebook actually working. Um, right. My jumping off point was the chapter in uh, Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus on faciality. They actually have a chapter in there on faciality where they talk about how with Byzantine art for the first time, you get the painting of Jesus looking directly at you uh, in close-up, and they say, well, this is the average white man, uh, and from that tradition on down, we get our idea of faciality, this, this idea of the average white man staring at you, and then if you... And then what I did was look back at the earlier examples of faciality in Greek art where uh, it tends to be the case, maybe not in every case, but it tends to be the case that in Greek art the statue rarely greets the viewer's eyes. It's Myron's disc throwers involved in his task, or the spear thrower. They're always doing something, but they're not looking directly at you, the viewer. Uh, in most cases, you're always going to find exceptions. To the you know, it, the extreme example of that would be the Barberini fawn, if you know that work at yes. all. Yes, I do. Yep. So, yeah. So, the, the examples uh, will be the rule and there will be exceptions to the rule, but that has tended to be the case until the Byzantines came along and conceived of this idea of faciality as en phase, you know, the face looking directly at you. And in Facebook, I think that's basically what we're looking at. We've got uh, the, the profile of the individual person, which in most cases, there again, there's exceptions, is uh, a person uh, looking directly at you. And this person, though, uh, we think of person, personage in the West as a three-dimensional individual with a past, with a history, with thoughts and opinions. And when that person speaks, they're not representing the point of view of the ancestors. As for example, in a tradition like Mesoamerica, where if you look at faciality in that society, in every case, the individual is nothing without a mask. You have to wear the mask. And the mask is usually this bird creature or uh, some other creature with open jaws through which the face of the person is looking out. So he's actually been swallowed up by the animal archetype. The god in that society has swallowed up the individual and there is no concept in Mesoamerican civilization, whether Mayan or Aztec, of individuality the way we in the West think of it. So when you are speaking or uttering in that society, you are opening yourself to the voice of a god that speaks through you. And very often, actually, in the West, we do have that tradition as well. We have the poet's dialogue with the muses, singing me muse. 
So we do have some of that tradition. But at least since the time